I'm David Wallace, founder of PV Reporter and our nonprofit sister organization in Men Cancer Connection. And your host for today's program, the American Society of Hematology, ASH 2021 Update. Our expert is Dr. Guy Abuzino from Will Cornell Medicine in New York. Doctor, thank you for joining us. Thank you, David, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So there was a lot of excitement this year at ASH. What should patients with MS, TB, and ET be looking forward to regarding uh, new and improved treatment options? It was an ASH packed with... Uh scientific developments in the field of MPN and other fields as well. It's a little bit hard to summarize ASH in only a few words, but I will say that every year we look forward to uh, the updates on several research uh, studies, including clinical trials, including preclinical studies. So studies done in the lab about uh, promising you know, agents that could be moved forward to clinical trial. The, the clinical trial session, I think, uh, had uh, several uh, interesting results, many of them very promising and, and look to be effective treatment agents. And it, some of these drugs are phase two studies, so earlier in development. Uh, and uh, of course, there are some phase three studies. Uh, but generally speaking, um, you know, the later phases are, are generally when the drugs have been uh, shown to be safe and have gotten to the point where we're looking at effectiveness. Uh, and some of these studies are randomized. Some of them are really single agent studies. So one of the studies we were looking forward to, and we've heard about uh, the past few years, is uh, the updated data on palabrasib, which is a BET inhibitor for the treatment of myelofibrosis. And that uh, study was presented, this ASH, uh, and also previous years, uh, showing that this drug has actually a unique efficacy in treating uh, the anemia of myelofibrosis. So patients who got onto the study who had myelofibrosis with anemia that may or may not have been transfusion dependent, we've seen uh, actually some really good responses in terms of hemoglobin improvement, becoming transfusion independent, also being a, a generally well-tolerated drug with uh, side effects that aren't, you know, for the most part, aren't severe side effects and are not too frequent. So, so this agent actually, uh, not only does it seem to be effective in treating anemia in a, in a subset of patients, certainly not everybody, but it actually had some benefits in uh, bone marrow fibrosis reversion, which is also uh, kind of a unique finding in, in some of these uh, newer drugs or the novel agents being developed. So the ability for a drug to reverse fibrosis is actually a promising finding because in, in the scientific community, we associate that with uh, disease modifying activity or the potential for a drug to really uh, reverse the ongoing process of disease progression and prevent it from happening. Now, I think it's still early to, to say for sure, uh, you know, this drug has been in development for a few years, but, uh, uh, you know, as we know, MPNs are chronic diseases and require really long, a longer follow-up to determine uh, if these drugs are truly uh, preventing progression. But this, this agent is now in phase three of development, and we're looking forward to hearing more about uh, what the phase three data is, is looking like or what it's showing. And it's actually being uh, expanded to the treatment of ET patients. So the study is also uh, open for the treatment of ET. Um, so that, I think, is, is one exciting agent to uh, look at the data. If you want to search it, it's all published online. Uh, or, you know, looking forward to the data to come in the next few years as well. Another study or s studies that came out um, that were also very promising, the results of the, the study resveratide, the drug resveratide, uh, which is a hepcidin mimetic uh, for treating polycythemia vera. And this drug actually has a unique mechanism of action. It sort of works on regulating iron metabolism and sort of, uh, in layman's terms, really shutting off the axis of iron into the red blood cells to try to slow down the red blood cell production. So this drug in the phase two clinical trial 
uh, whether used uh, alone as a monotherapy or in combination with another cytoreductive agent that patients may have already been on but continue to require phlebotomy, it appears that patients treated on this trial with this drug have, for the most part, become phlebotomy independent. So the vast majority of patients who required at least three phlebotomies within six months from starting this study have no longer required phlebotomies, and there may have been a few who needed one or two phlebotomies here and there, but overall, very, very exciting to hear um, that patients can really be uh, free of uh, phlebotomies with this treatment. So I think that would be uh, second on the list. And, and certainly there are a few other studies that are you know, unique agents with different mechanisms of actions targeting different pathways. Some of the pathways that have been particularly interesting to look into and target are, you know, one, the TGF-beta pathway, TGF-beta or tumor growth factor beta is a sort of a cytokine uh, signaling pathway that uh, really, you know, is overactive in MPNs, particularly with myofibrosis. So drugs that have worked on trying to target that axis uh, have shown various sort of um, efficacy results um, uh, in treating not only MPNs, but other myeloid neoplasms. You know, for instance, there is a drug approved for MDS known as Lospatercept, which uh, targets that axis too, and has shown uh, to be very effective in treating anemia of myelodysplastic syndrome. That's also being investigated in MPNs. And there are other agents who that are similar to targeting these pathways. So one of those studies actually was a single center study by the MD Anderson, where they used a drug called Cetatercept to uh, target that axis and found that indeed there was a benefit in terms of treating anemia. So as you can tell, you know, there's sort of a variety of agents in different pathways targeting different mechanisms and, and the different subtypes of MPNs. Uh, generally, myelofibrosis is where the majority of clinical trials are run. Uh, and sometimes these active agents, when they do have good activity in myelofibrosis, they're uh, used in ET or sometimes PV. Uh, PV does have a, a potentially sort of a unique pathophysiology that we don't see with the others, including you know, things like iron metabolism. Uh, and so that drug is really only active in PV as far as we know, resveratide. So, yeah, I mean, I think that kind of summarized the clinical trials. Uh, you know, there are certainly many others out there that uh, are worth, you know, reviewing and looking at. There are some that were presented as an oral presentation and others uh, as posters, but uh, definitely it was a, a very exciting ASH and a lot of advancements in the field. Okay, excellent. So I'm seeing artificial intelligence or AI play really kind of an expanding role in NPN research from clinical trial matching to bone marrow histopathology. That's a mouthful. So first of all, tell us what is histopathology and how might AI be used to gain a deeper understanding of NPNs and the various gene mutations? That is a very, very good question, David. Uh, you know, artificial intelligence has become uh, a, a major, a hot topic in the field of medicine and really uh, many other fields in our day-to-day uh, -day lives. You know, understanding artificial intelligence is understanding that the human brain, uh, as fascinating as it is, has some limitations. And although we have our own neural networks, uh, we don't always we're not always capable of swallowing in very large amounts of data and making sense of it. Even when we put our minds together, sometimes we, you know, there are certain patterns that we don't, you know, we just don't see. Uh, our brain doesn't see or our eye doesn't see. Artificial intelligence really works to try to synthesize as much data as there is available, you know, including microscopic data that the eye doesn't see, you know, things that show up on histopathology, meaning bone marrow biopsies, looking under the microscope at very high power, trying to look at these microscopic cells, uh, how they appear and how they interact with their environment is part of that. There's a lot of data in there about how these cells look like in the bone marrow, what type of cells there are, what percentage of them, uh, how they're organized, sort of what the architecture is. 
what's the degree of fibrosis, for instance. You know, all that kind of data, if you try to put it together, the, the, probably the best way to do it nowadays is to use uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence to uh, synthesize all that information, not only from one patient, but from several patients who have these diseases, uh, and try to make sense of patterns or trends to say that there is a common trend or a common pattern in how these bone marrows look like that can potentially tell us some information about how the disease is going to behave or how it will potentially respond to a specific treatment. So, you know, as the amount of data we, we have nowadays increases, uh, we really have to think about how we can capitalize on artificial intelligence uh, to help us, help us figure out uh, not only a prognosis, but also uh, treatment options, and even help us uh, establish a diagnosis a little bit better too. Can you shed some light on uh, what actually is histopathology? Uh, yeah, so histopathology is really looking uh, at uh, sort of how the cells look like under the microscope. So it is essentially, you know, for instance, bone marrow biopsy is a good example of where we look at histopathology. So when bone marrow biopsies are processed, uh, they're usually stained for different markers that allow uh, us to uh, look at these cells under the microscope and, and it sort of gives the cells uh, certain colors and uh, it allows us to uh, identify what these cells are and how they look in their environment uh, and how that appearance can be associated with a particular diagnosis. So the way we diagnose myeloproliferative neoplasms is not only by looking at the uh, mutations like JAK2 and the blood counts, but also by looking at the histopathology of the bone marrow. You know, maybe another term to use is bone marrow morphology. How does, how does the bone marrow look like under the microscope after all the staining is done? Okay, that's perfect. Thank you.